Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Wall Street or Main Street podcast. Mo is here, and our guest is a returning guest, is Jeff Brown. He's the author of a new book, Shine Rising, Capitals Road, and Socialist Destination. Uh, you can buy the book. It's available on Amazon and on his website, www.shinerising.com. Uh, Puntu Press dot com. Punto, Punto uh, Press. Puto Ted. Punto. Uh, Punto Press. All right. Ah, sorry about that. Punto Press dot com. Jeff, how you doing? I'm doing great. Welcome from Shenzhen, China. Yeah. So you recently moved there from Beijing, and uh, we talked before the podcast, and you're enjoying the life there compared to Beijing. You compared it to moving from the East Coast to the West Coast in the United States. More, a little bit more relaxing there, right? Yeah, very much. Uh, sort of the op, you know, sort of from New York City to to San Jose, California. It's very laid back here, and the people are much. It's much slower. <clears throat> you know, the the people are more courteous and less aggressive, and um, you know, there's less of an attitude here, and and, uh, and you know, it's worse. It's a jungle because uh, we're inside. The you know tropic of of, of uh, cancer, uh, 22 degrees north, and and so it's just it's a nice change. We were in Beijing for 13 years, uh, 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 starting in 1990, a total of 13 years, and and so it'll, it's it'll be fun to now experience um, you know China from the bottom up. Up um, for the for, <clears throat> for your fans out there that don't know, Shenzhen is the <clears throat> major special economic zone just north of the Hong Kong border. Um, and it's just, just nice, you know, it's just an interesting change of pace. And, and I'm looking forward to, for my journalism and book writing to have a chance to, you know, maybe be, do a little, see China maybe more from an economic and industrial and technolo- and technology standpoint, uh, since this is one of the great, you know, technology and, and, uh, informational you know hubs of the world Shenzhen and maybe a little bit less politics which uh, dominates so much of uh, you know life in Beijing right and there's like about maybe a dozen of mega cities in China like cities like New York City in China that well correct? yeah well well New York City is just a is you know an average size city <clears throat> um, uh, in, in 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 China you know Beijing has 23 million uh, Shanghai has 23 million. Uh, Chongqing has, um, depending on how far out you want to take the border of, of the town, somewhere you know 25 to 32 million. <clears throat> um, uh, Guangzhou, uh, Guangzhou, the capital of Guangdong or Canton, as Westerners <clears throat> or want to call it, um, you know, 20 something million. <clears throat> and you know, New York is, you know, what 10 million. And I mean, that's that. You know, Shenzhen's 13 million. And there's so many cities over here that have, you know, 10 million people. <laughs> you, you, you just don't even, you know, you don't even think about it. So it's on a whole nother scale, um, you know, the population centers. And so what's happened is, is you have hubs, you know, you have like cities that are so big, you know, like <coughs> Beijing and Tianjin, <coughs> which are which are neighboring cities, but they are so big that they are now starting to plan the these mega regions are not even called cities anymore they're called mega regions and so what they're going to do is is they've picked out 10 um regions in in chi- in China and they're going to seamlessly integrate the infrastructure the uh the public services like you know garbage and rail and bus and uh, sewage and electricity and roads and everything, and and instead of thinking about Beijing, they're going to be thinking about Beijing, the the Beijing Tianjin mega region. Then you've got Shanghai with Hangzhou and um, uh, Suzhou, a huge triangle down there. That's a hundred million people. Uh, Beijing Tianjin, th- that area is a hundred million. Uh, Chongqing. Um, um, has surrounding sister cities. That's, a, that's another hundred million, uh, and then the biggest one where we are living now, um, including Hong Kong, uh, is the Pearl the Pearl River Delta, which is the you know the the which is the economic you know motor of uh, of southern China, and that's going to be about 160 million. And so the, these numbers are just you know fantastic you know to the ears of a Westerner. 
uh, but uh, um, um, this is how this is how the government, you know, is working here and planning for the not just the 21st century, but the 22nd century. Okay, so that's interesting. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about the uh, Chinese economy. Um, the last time we talked, which was over just about a year ago, which um, we had the stock market crash in China, the Shanghai Composite had a single a single biggest drop, one day drop in 2007. Uh, at one point, trading down eight percent, while other Chinese stock exchange crashed even more. Um, and in, in the aftermath of that, uh, the Chinese government and the central banks uh, passed a lot of regulations, and they also expanded credit as well. Uh, so, how has the Chinese economy reacted since that credit expansion and the aftermath of the uh, Chinese stock market crashing? And I, I know that most of the Chinese people there don't even invest in the stock market; it's more like gambling for them. Yeah, the you know that this there's um there's this idea that you know the Chinese that the Chinese economy is some sort of you know freewheeling you know jungle capitalist you know country and it's not at all true. This is a very centrally planned um, uh, economy. You know every square millimeter, every square inch of this country is owned by you know the the the, the state or the people. It's there's no private private real estate here. And they, you know, they they have their they have their hands in every course. You know, they own basically the government owns, you know, all key sectors, the hundred biggest, you know, industries, you know, chemicals, you know, aerospace, defense, you know, coal, steel, airlines, insurance, banks. They're all state owned, and so uh, and that includes the stock markets. That includes the the gold the the Shanghai Gold Exchange. That includes you know just anything that. Uh, that uh, um, uh, has an impact, uh, a large impact on the economy. So for the Chinese government, you know, to go in after what happened in Shanghai and the Shenzhen market, uh, there's that's the two big stock markets here. Um, they went in and uh, fa- they found out that hedge funds, um, both Chinese and and overseas, uh, had found loopholes in the laws. Just like they do in New York and London and Paris, they look for ways to, you know, circumvent the law to maximize their profits, regardless of the of the <laughs> of the social costs or whatever. And they 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 use they use those loopholes. Um, much of the, as you said, much, it actually the 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 drop started actually on the on the Chinese Chinese shares. Um, there, there's two, there's two different shares. There's A shares and B shares and the foreigners buy largely one and then the Chinese buy largely the other. And most of it was being caused by day traders, a handful, I think about 6% of the, of the Chinese population is in, is invested in the, in the, in the stock market here. So it's really, there, it's really just a handful of, you know, day traders, you know, what semi wealthy, wealthy people and hedge funds who are really involved in it. So the the government came in and they, they stopped, um, uh, they, they, they put limits on, you know, uh, uh, how quickly you could sell, you know, buy and sell. They put limits on, they put limits on short sales. They put limits on, um, um, you know, just all kinds of, um, uh, uh, ways to, to to put to rein in these hedge funds and, and these day traders, and like in like in New York and you know, London and Paris and with their plunge teams, um, um, the the you know the stock market over here is just as rigged as the, the it is as, as the ones are in the West and and so the government went in and also bought you know shares which is not hard because all the shares are you know a lot of them were you know government owned industries anyway uh and and it's worked fine i you know the the gov- the, the the economy hasn't missed a beat you know people <clears throat> you know the 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 great you know uh, uh asian tiger meltdown in 1997 uh the chinese economy didn't miss a beat um the, the in 2008 you know the the great american you know meltdown the chinese economy didn't miss a beat uh, the the West loves to distract its citizens by talking about Chinese debt, uh, so as they, so that people don't have to you know 
start thinking about the even more astronomical debt in the West. Uh, the, the debt here is manageable. Uh, the banks are all government owned, and so uh, the Chinese print their own money. They the, the the Treasury prints its own money. It does not it does not um, uh, borrow money from the Rothschilds and from the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and you know private banks. Um, and so they the, the, the nothing. It's just it's just you, know, you just live over here and you just. Walk around with your with your jaw dropping. I mean, this economy is just humming, and it it hasn't stopped since you know nineteen actually well, actually since nineteen forty nine. I mean, it, it's been growing you know exponentially <laughs> for the last sixty years, and now in purchase power, purchasing power parities, it's the world's largest economy, and even an exchange rate in the next two or three years is going to surpass the U.S. economy. Uh, it's um, these 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 men and women who, you know, uh, are run the 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 government over here, the Communist Party. They know how to govern a country. They know how to take care of their people, and and it's working. So yeah, well, we haven't missed a beat. I we 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 didn't notice anything in Beijing when in a year ago, and I don't think ninety nine percent of the people in China did either. Yeah, in, in terms of uh, the economy and the infrastructure. Uh, even in the education, um, China is way far, way further ahead than the, U the U.S. Um, even though I think a lot of the Chinese students come over to the U.S. when they go to college, but eventually they go back after they graduate, right? Well, yeah, more and more. In fact, uh, I just did um, a couple of really fascinating interviews on my on my website, <clears throat> China Rising, with um, a retired international educator named Godfrey Roberts, Doctor Godfrey Roberts, and we did a couple of really interesting interviews um, on China's education system. And again, there's all this, you know, imperial propaganda in the West about the, about, you know, the superiority of America's universities and all the Chinese want to go to the American universities and we, you know, European universities. Basically, you know, when you, when you really do the analysis is, is the ones that are going to the, in, to, to, to the universities of the U.S., are the ones that are not good enough to pass the exams to get into universities here, and uh, and as you said, uh, maybe back in the 80s, uh, before the Chinese economy really took off, uh, some of them, you know, or maybe most of them stayed overseas, uh, but now many of them are coming back, <clears throat> um, you know, and now more and more of them are coming back. I mean, the number of students who are going to school in 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 the West is, I mean, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the, you know, 9 million graduates, uh, university graduates here every year. And, um, I, you know, I just, uh, uh, Nature Magazine just came out with their research and development index, and nine of the top 10 universities in the world are now ranked as the, as, as, uh, the producing the best quality research on planet earth and the the only one that was in the top 10 was stanford from the united states every other one, one was chinese and so there's this you know westerners are deluded that 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 the chinese are a bunch of you know mindless copycats you know stealing technology uh you know I, it's it's really interesting now now chinese companies are suing apple and samsung and dell and all these Western companies and are and are reaping, you know, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in, in you know, in patent concessions because they, it's their technology that Apple and Samsung and Dell and others stole from the Chinese. So, uh, the, the the Chinese are innovative. Uh, I encourage you and every. Everybody else, all your fans out there, to listen to those two um, interviews. Uh, first, you know the Shanghai school system is ranked as the top school system in the world, uh, uh, and then our second interview was about about universities and and uh, this again this misconception that you know Chinese universities are are awful. In fact, my da our daughter, our, our twenty year old daughter, is is uh, actually going to go to school next year, and so it's September. She's starting in two weeks. Uh, she's going to be going to go to Beijing Normal University um, and uh, studying human resources here in China. Um, uh, 
and she's actually going to be taking her courses in Chinese. So there's and the, and the other secret is there's hundreds of thousands of, of foreign students going to school here. You know the um, you know, there's now a mass influx of Americans and people coming from from around the world to go to school here because this is where it's happening. I mean this is where it's at, baby. You know I mean this is this is where the action is and um, and so uh, you know I, I I maintain that Beijing is the most powerful city in the world. It's, not Washington, London, or Paris. Yeah, and I, I get irritated when I see the politician and even the presidential candidate in the U.S. complaining about China manipulating the currency, the, taking on too much debt, or, uh, you know, the way they treat their own citizens when the U.S. has all the same problem, maybe 10 times worse than what's going on in China. Uh, so maybe they should just uh, fix things at home and not worry about what's going on in China. Well, absolutely. You know, the 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 West, uh, you know, Washington, London, and Paris, and and um, even Japan. Uh, uh, you know, just about any you know you know Western uh, economy, their 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 middle classes are being destroyed. Uh, thousands of <laughs> families are sliding from you know middle class status to lower income status. Um, and whereas China is you know, starting in 1949 with uh, you know liberation has dramatically improved the well-being of, of their people uh, in the last 30 years. They, depending on your your numbers, whether you want to use World Bank or IMF or U- United Nations, but the Chinese brought somewhere between you know 500 and 700 million people out of out of poverty. Uh, China now has the world's largest middle class, 300 million people, as many people as there are in the United States. China has that big of a middle class. And because of good government, because of sound policies, because of visionary um, you know, management of the economy, <laughs> it is estimated that the Chinese are adding 10,000 citizens to the middle class every day. Not every week or month, but every day, ten thousand a day, and they're adding a billionaire a, a, a week, and so the 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 economy here is it, it's making some people very rich, but the difference is is compared to the West is as 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 wealth has you know trickled up you know up and up and up to the to the one percent the China. Chinese government, the Communist Party over here, <laughs> to make sure that their social stability is is keeping, you know, making sure that that much of that wealth, you know, flows down uh, to the um, to the middle class, and not only the middle class, Mo, but President Xi. I mean, since he got in office, they're on. They are. They have a commitment, you know, to re, to lift uh, seventy million of the poorest of the poor. Out of out of uh, out of extreme poverty uh, by 2020, and they are spending. The first tranche was 15 billion U.S. the equivalent of 15 billion U.S. to bring these people out of out of out of poverty, mostly in 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 mountain valleys and you know, isolated areas in the western part of the country. And they have a they have reserved another a total of 60 billion. U.S. dollars to bring these to bring China's poorest of the poor um, out of poverty. So you know, every time Xi Jinping comes back from a, world, a trip around the world, one of the first things, and and also Li Keqiang, the premier, they go on TV. They're going out into the into poor areas of, of China, you know, talking to the the poorest of the poor, campaigning, you know, to 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 promote their anti. They're, well, not, not poverty reduction, poverty elimination is what they're calling it. And so how many world leaders, I ask you, Mo, how many world le- leaders are spending a considerable amount of their PR and, and, and policy uh, initiatives on, on helping, the, helping the, the neediest in society today? It, it's like nobody except China. And so it's just you know it's amazing to watch, and so we are seeing we are we are seeing the the greatest creation of wealth 
uh, in in human history uh, here in China. Uh, and what's so amazing about it is is that because of the because of the good governance of the Communist Party, which upsets a lot of Westerners, I admit, but because of the good the good governance of the Communist Party, most of it is is going to the you know the working class, you know the white collar, blue collar, and poor people. And um, uh, but they are also creating, like I said, a billionaire a week. So, do you have any concern that the Chinese economy is in a uh, boom bust phase? Uh, I don't know if you familiar with that term, boom, yeah, boom yeah, and bust. Yeah, 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 but because I mean, even though there's a free market economy there, there's always going to be boom and bust because their growth, uh, it's great, but it's not sustainable, and it's, and it's going to be a time where things are going to flow down. And I'm not well, going to say I'm not, I'm not like the people in the mainstream media that's going to say China's economy is going to turn to dust once there's a bust. I think there's going to be a slowdown in China, but it's not going to be the end of the world for them. Well, it already is slowing down. I mean, they have gone from you know seven, seven and a half, eight percent. I mean, they have averaged, they have averaged eight percent growth. Um, well, actually, closer to ten percent growth uh, since the since the late nineteen eighties. Over eight percent growth uh, since uh, the early eighties. <laughs> even 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 during even during Mao's era, nineteen forty nine to nineteen seventy eight. You know, everybody thought that that was an economic disaster. It was not. The the economy grew, you know, seven uh, percent uh, during Mao's era. Uh, per year, and it was only one percent less. The United States, you know, during that same period, forty-nine to seventy-eight, the economy grew eight percent, and you know, that was when you know the United States had half the world's GDP and you know the reserve currency of the world, and yet you know you know China still managed to grow seven percent a year from seventy from forty nineteen forty-nine to nineteen seventy-eight. So the the uh, yeah, it's, and it slowed down. It was up at ten percent, you know, in the late eighties, nineties, uh, and now it's you know it was slowed down to seven to eight, and now they're talking you know around you know six and a half to seven. Uh, they are talking about eventually you know tr- you know accepting some somewhere in the area you know five to six percent a year. So it is going to slow down, but because Mo, because they are a centrally planned economy because the government owns the banks the insurance companies the airlines the train the trains the roads the ports the stock markets you know the gold exchange you know just you know just petrochemicals uh you know the shipping industry you know just go because all of that is is owned by by the government and because the chinese print their own money and don't borrow it from um, you know, from from you know the, uh, the West wealthy banking families, the oil bankers like the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers, um, they they will they like I said in 1997, you know the uh, Asia went into a meltdown and China didn't miss a beat. You know, 2008, China didn't miss a beat, and um, and and so because. It, uh, of the fact that they do, they don't really have a, it, you know, at, at the at the national level, they do not have a capitalist economy. It's very much a centrally planned economy, as you and I talked. You know, mom and pop, you know, hairdressers, you know, uh, music shops, grocery stores, you know, restaurants. You know, at that level, uh, there's a, a massive amount of, of, of private enterprise over here. But you get up above that, and it really, be, you know, especially the, the 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 heavyweight industries, it's all owned by the government. So they have the ability to, you know, use the you know use the levers and and strings uh, of policy and um, and 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 finance to smooth over, you know, these slowdowns and these ups and downs. So China really has not experienced a boom and bust. Um, um uh in at least since 1949 so it's uh, it's it's an impressive track record uh yes indeed um and they definitely benefit from being a manufacturing economy and imp- exporting all their goods to western countries um so let's talk about the gold and silver market in china uh so far this year in the first half of this year china demand has been at 978 ton which is the 
7% decrease from last year. Uh, what has contributed to the decrease in demand for gold and silver? Well, I don't, you know, there, you, first off, you have to take the <laughs> the gold and silver numbers over here with a grain of salt because uh, it's it's how much gold China has is a state secret, though they are in order to satisfy um, uh, IMF requirements now that China has um, is now a part of the uh, 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 its currency. The, the RMB is now uh, a part of the uh, special drawing rights of the IMF, uh, we, we, which we should talk about because they just uh, – uh, uh, China just issued its first um, – the first SDR bonds since 1981 um, uh, with the new – with the RMB. Uh, um, so – but they are supposed to declare their real their, – their real gold holdings. I think it's October 15th is the, is the date limit. Uh, everything – you know, the, officially they've got like, you know, 3,000 tons. Nobody believes that. Um, I mean, they they bought the the Rockefeller Gold Vault, 2,000 tons uh, capacity in New York. They bought another 2,000 ton, you know, vault in uh, London. I can't remember, was it not Goldman Sachs, but uh, maybe it was Morgan Stanley. But anyway, they bought the you know, they bought that gold vault. They've got a gold vault uh, in uh, in Hunan, uh, which is uh, in, um, uh, Mao Zedong's you know home province, just north of here, in fact. Um, in sh- north of Shenzhen, uh, you know, a, a, an entire mountainside has been dug out, uh, and that's basically China's, you know, Fort Knox. Uh, and so the speculation is, is that they, ha- you know, have somewhere between, you know, five thousand and twenty-five thousand metric tons. Uh, so nobody really knows. I mean, they're, you know, they are the world's largest mining, you know, gold miner. So I, you know, is it down? I'm sure you know. So you said seven percent, Mo. It's gone down seven percent. Yeah, uh, according to ZeroHedge.com, yeah. the demand been down seven percent from last year. But yeah, yeah, I agree. They're they're always very shady about their, yeah, their demand. Well, they they look upon they look upon their gold reserves as a as a as a strategic <laughs> as strategic information. And uh, when you're you know, battling against Western Empire, um, you know, you you can't blame them really. So, you know, to be honest with you, whatever number they come out with <coughs> in October, uh, I would say that would probably be the floor. That would be the absolute minimum they would have. I mean, they can always sit there because they not only have their Fort Knox in in Hunan Province, they have um, they have gold they have gold vaults in their 21 central bank branches around the country, uh, you know Beijing the the the, the 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 headquarters of the central bank of China, the People's Bank of China. You know they have a huge vault up there. Um, I think you know I mean let, I mean you, you you and I can just imagine what would happen in the world. And to gold prices, if China came out and said, "Oh, we have twenty-five thousand tons of gold," you know, uh, when they make the announcement on on October uh, October fifteenth, I think is the date, it would just literally turn, you know, blow the the gold econ the the gold price, you know, would go through the roof, and you know, the 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 <laughs> there would probably be economic panic around the world, and uh, and. So I don't. I think whatever they declare in October will be uh, the the absolute minimum, because they can always say that oh we we forgot about this or we we forgot about that, but they they're not going to overstate. But I think they're definitely going to understate. Uh, all the gold on the Shanghai <clears throat> market, um, you know, it's 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 a physical gold market. There's no paper in Shanghai, and you know most of that, if not all of that. Is, is is going into the into the you know into the government vaults, although you know the the you know there's jewel there's ju- you know, jewelers. Oh, also, uh, uh, China allowed gave authorization for the um, largest private gold vault to be built uh, just near here uh, in Guangzhou, uh, outside of Shenzhen, the Hong Kong um, Jewelers Association. Uh, is uh, building a 2,000 metric ton uh, vault, uh, private vault uh, here. 
So uh, if it's down seven percent, I mean, you know, it's, you know, it's not, it's not going to, you know, always be going up. And and uh, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of talk in the West about you know the difficulty of finding gold, physical gold. You know, the people are having a hard time finding it. That may be China's case too. And uh, but they are the world's largest miner. They're the world's largest buyer. And seven uh, percent up or down, that's not going to change. Uh, and so I, uh, I, I think that's pretty, a pretty insignificant number when you look at the scale at which uh, you know China is, um, uh, de- is is developing its gold market with the Shanghai Gold Exchange, et cetera. Yeah, China has been taking advantage of uh, the low gold prices, and they try to uh, drag it as long as they can to try to, you know hide their numbers as long as they can regarding how much they have uh, bought but um well you, I, there's been there, there's been report that they bought more than the annual mining supply uh, at one time well and i i'm sure there's st- i'm sure there's gold coming in that that's that, that we don't even know about and yeah i mean you know just they i mean i i think it's i think it's just, it's pretty obvious to anybody that you know takes a look at at china's strategy you know, eventually, you know, China does want a gold-backed RMB. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and I've read reports, uh, you know, from qual- you know, exper- you know, experienced economists that they would only need, you know, about you know, eight or ten thousand tons to 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 do that. Um, and so uh, I've I've read anywhere from they officially claim <laughs> it's just some ridiculous number, like something a little bit less than three thousand tons. Up to twenty five thousand, and uh, you know, by some um, experts in 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 the field. Um, but the I think eventually, you know, as as the American Empire continues to stumble and and uh, you know um, print you know you know vast amounts of you know dollars and euros and yen, and you know, for to to maintain their one thousand military bases around the world and their 250,000 soldiers around the world and the 6th fleet in the Pacific and the the you know the 5th fleet in the Mediterranean and all you know this massive you know military um uh blanket that uh, that the west is paying for uh as that as that as that starts to unwind i think uh you know maybe when when the, when there's a run on the dollar eventually <laughs> Uh, when people realize that their their U.S. treasuries are not worth very much, uh, I think, think it maybe at that point, you know, China may you know you know move in for the kill and announce, well, we have you know eighteen or twenty thousand metric tons of gold, and the RMB is effectively a, you know a gold backed currency as of today. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that happened within my lifetime. All right. Well, before we let you go, let's talk about your book, uh, China Rising. Um, so. Why did you decide to write it, and what will reader take away from reading your book? Well, you know, this is my second um, China book. My first one was called Forty Four Days uh, Backpacking in China, uh, it, which is it sounds like a travel book. And my my editor said I, I should have changed the title, uh, and he was right because it really wasn't a travel book. It was more of a, a, pol- uh, a you know a geopolitical you know journey uh, you know to discover you know China past present and future. Uh, so my first book was, you know, I got out and I traveled twelve and a half thousand kilometers and into the hinterlands, you know, the some of the poorest regions of China. And that's when I was so, you know, amazed, you know, at what was going on. Because we, we lived here from 1990 to 1997, back when it was basically the, you know, really, really the, what everybody thinks of China is, you know, the what I call the wild east to, you know, Deng Xiaoping buckaroo days, you know, back when it was just sort of anything goes, you know, you know, sort of a, that that jungle capitalism that everybody, you know, has bought into that they, they think China's like, that doesn't happen anymore. And and so, but that was 1990, 1990 to 1997, and I came back in 2010, and I took this big trip in, in 2012, and I was just, I was just, you know, Floored, you know, at what what this country had done in the 14 years that we were gone, and what they were doing in the poorest parts of the country. So I wrote 44 days um, 
and uh, which is also available on Amazon. And, and so it was just a continuation. I, I, I started doing journalism like with people, good people like you, started writing columns. I had a column on my website, a weekly column. And <clears throat> so the, the China, China Rising is, is, an, is a continuation of 44 days <clears throat> that really gets into, you know, how the government works, how the Communist Party works, <clears throat> how they perceive um, the West. Uh, it's not a pretty picture. They don't you know the Chinese leadership over here. They, they, hate the, they hate the West. They hate Washington. They hate London. And they, they hate Paris. Uh, they hate Tokyo um, for their imperial um, arrogance <clears throat> and their military overreach. And, the, you know, the fact that, you know, a tiny country like England, you know, has, you know, has so much, you know, historical, you know, influence on <laughs> on world events. You know, you know, you have you have Russia and, you know, the United States and, and, and China on the <laughs> the U.N. Security Council. And you got little France and, and and little U.K., you know, on the U.N. Security Council. So I want you know, when when people read China Rising, they they learn about the country, the economy, the people, the politics, the, how the government works. You know, everybody thinks it's some totalitarian hellhole. It's not. It's a very vibrant democracy, but it's a democracy that's different than the Western than than, than the West's uh, democracy. And I would and I would state that it's a more functional and more responsive democracy than the West democracy. It's just different. It's just and I explain all of that how it works. Um, and, uh, and then there's a lot of the book, a lot, uh, a lot of the book is just the West and how the West has, re has related to China since 1517 when, you know, the first Portuguese ship landed not far from where, where I'm sitting right now up and, you know, through the century of humiliation, the opium wars and the horrific, um, you know, uh, humiliation that the Chinese experienced from 1839 to 1949. Um, you know, World War II, World War One. Um, there's just so much Chinese history that that is that uh, that Westerners are, are not familiar with, and there's so much misconception about China today and uh, the people here, and and so I just it's just a it's just a an expand, uh, just a, a whole rainbow, you know, a whole a whole rainbow of uh, of information um, uh, about China, you know, you know, going back five thousand years uh, up up until today, so that people can really have a firm understanding, especially especially how the Chinese people and the Chinese leadership, you know, look at the West and um, and how they, you know, how they how they interpret the West and how they are reacting and how the China, the China, especially the Chinese leadership. I mean, they, they are at war. I mean, they are at war with the West and, uh, they are, and they, and they intend to win and, uh, they intend to win in the 21st century. And that's, and, and I think people would, would, you know, the, the, those that who are reading it and the book reviews that are on Amazon so far, you know, are saying it's a, it's a very, um, you know, informative and, and, and detailed and, and interesting and, and fascinating book because it's just information that you just do not find in, in, in mainstream, you know, Western media, <clears throat> you know, from, from, you know, from a, from a, a you know, from a a, a, a Caucasian, you know, guy, you know, who's lived over here for 13 years and speaks the language. So it, it is a, it is a unique uh, perspective. Perspective, and I think it's a perspective that Westerners need to understand and appreciate because China is is roaring like a lion, and, and uh, there is no stopping them. And 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 and, <clears throat> and the West had better understand that, uh, you know, as as China keeps rising and the West keeps you know falling, um, there's going to be a tectonic plate shift uh, in world geopolitics. You know, hopefully within my lifetime. Yeah, and there's uh, a lot of tension going on between the U.S. and China, and the next, whoever the next president is, they have not said any good things about China as well, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. So, uh, Jeff, thank you for your time, and if people want to find out... 
Oh, no problem. If people want to find out about your book, where can they go? Yeah, go to Amazon.com uh, or Amazon.uk or Amazon. You know, fr for France. Just go to Amazon. Uh, Jeff uh, Jeff uh, Brown, China Rising. That should be enough to find it. Uh, it's also available on Ganshi G A N X Y, which is an independent uh, ebook distributor. Um, and my website is www.chinarising.puntopress.com. P U N T O P R E S S dot com. That's my publisher, and there's I've got uh, uh, over a hundred articles on my website right now, and you know interviews, and uh, the people have interviewed me, and I've interviewed people, and and all of that's on my website, uh, as well as information about forty four days in China Rising, and and uh, always love talking to you, Mo, and let's try to do it more than once a year. <laughs> yeah, definitely, uh, definitely, you could come back on. Come back on again soon. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Talk to you later, Mo. Bye-bye.